Hi everybody, this is Mrs. Martin and this is our schema presentation for the novel The Outsiders by S.E. Hinton. Schema, as you know, is prior knowledge and just like when we read the novel 910, it's always important for you to have an idea of the time period and the world in which a story exists. So that way you can understand a little bit better why the characters react the way they do. So for our presentation, we're taking a look specifically at the 1960s because that is the time period in which the story happens. Because of the fact that some of the uh, characters live in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, we are also looking at some of the influences that were felt in the Midwest during this time period. So uh, if you have your Cornell notes ready to go, let's do it. So the first thing we're going to look at is the music because there's a lot of different artists that influence the way uh, young people feel about music. And this is no exception. During the 1960s, uh, one of the biggest artists was Elvis Presley, who is also known as the King. So um, Elvis Presley was born in Mississippi. He really didn't intend to be a musician. Um, he was you know, part of a very poor family who relocated to Memphis, Tennessee when he was 13 years old. And so um, one day he's, you know, wandering downtown Memphis with his friends and they go into a place called Sun Records. And Sun Records uh, was a record shop where you could purchase music. But in the back, they also had these little recording booths and you could, you know, do novelty songs. Like if you wanted to, you know, sing happy birthday for somebody, they would record you singing it and they would put it on vinyl for you and then they would uh, sell it to you. So that way you could give that as a gift to like your mom or your aunt or whoever. So um, what ended up happening was Elvis and his friends were messing around. He recorded and uh, the owner of Sun Records, a man named Sam Phillips, was kind of blown away by the way Elvis sounded and really was excited um, and offered to help him start a career. Um, and again, Elvis wasn't intending to be a musician. He wasn't intending to be a star. Um, but Sam Phillips sent out the copy of Elvis singing to radio DJs because again, at the time there was no digital music, there was no Pandora, no Spotify, there was no internet. So you couldn't see artists on YouTube. If you wanted to discover new music, you had to listen to land radio because there was no satellite radio at this time either. So uh, he literally sent these vinyls to radio stations, land-based radio stations. And um, those DJs liked what they heard. They played what they heard. Um, and the fans reacted and wanted to know where can they find this guy? Where can they buy his music? And that really did start his career. So notes wise, uh, what you're going to want to write down is Elvis Aaron Presley. Uh, his nickname is the King. He's the King of rock and roll. Uh, age 19 discovered by Sun Records owner, Sam Phillips. Um, this is where it gets interesting for him in 1956, his hit was Heartbreak Hotel. It was his first number one hit. So that really did introduce him to the entire country and the world. Um, and to this day, you can find Elvis fans in all corners of the world. What gets interesting is that um, Elvis always wanted to serve his country. So in 1958, at the height of his stardom, he had several number one hits. Uh, things like Hound Dog and Teddy Bear. And People thought, okay, great, he's just going to keep producing this great music and touring. Uh, he decided to join the army and fulfill his dream of serving his country. Um, they did shave off his hair, which was a big deal, believe it or not, because he was very well known for his iconic hair. Um, and then he wore the uniform and, and they put him into service, but he didn't serve in the military the way regular folks would. Um, they used him more of as a cultural ambassador. He toured around Europe, he toured around the world, uh, and he spent two years doing that. So in a way, Elvis did serve his country, but probably not the way he had imagined when he wanted to sign on. Um, in 1960, he returned to the U.S. and he told his management he really didn't want to tour because at this time, the way musical acts would get their 
uh, you know, following and their fans was by touring excessively. We're talking in excess of 250, 300 days a year. So it's a lot. He didn't really want to do that anymore. So he, instead, he told them he was interested in making movies. And for every movie he made, he contributed to the movie soundtrack, which makes sense. Um, but it also widened his fan base, believe it or not. Um, because in the early 1950s, when he first broke, young kids loved him. Adults, not so much. They considered him a bad influence. They considered him negative. Uh, when he was pictured on TV, they would only shoot him from his shoulders up because they were concerned that his wild style of dancing would drive kids crazy. So unfortunately, a lot of the adults really didn't see the appeal. Uh, but in the 60s, when he started doing two movies a year and he was constantly uh, represented in these different roles in movie theaters, um, all people of all ages fell in love with Elvis. Uh, and that really did become a, a huge part of his legacy. Elvis Presley did die in the late 1970s. He died of an opioid drug over, overdose. Um, so that goes to show you that, you know, some incredibly talented people get caught up in addiction in unfortunate ways. And, and because of that, we will never really know what his full potential would have been had he survived past the age of 40. So um, with that being said, I'm going to ask you to jump on over to Google Classroom and click on the video link so you can enjoy uh, the clip from his one of his first movies, Jailhouse Rock, which um, the adults weren't crazy about because it looks like they're having a great time in jail, and that's really not what you want your young kids exposed to. So uh, you can pause this here, jump on over, watch the video clip. And if you like what you hear from Elvis, put a star in your notes next to his name. Uh, if you, it's not for you, just put an X, because uh, different characters in the book we're about to read react to Elvis differently. Okay, if you are back, that means you've seen the Elvis Presley clip. And now we're going to move on to a different style of music, and this is country music, which is represented here by Hank Williams Sr. As I said earlier, our story takes place in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So this is the Midwest of our country. Country music has always been very big there. Um, and Hank Williams is a big part of the reason why. Um, Hank Williams Sr. was actually born in 1923 in Alabama, uh, but he, unlike Elvis, knew he wanted to be a musician. It's something he pursued from a young age. It took him to about the age of 21 to become famous, but once he did, he was very prolific, meaning he wrote lots and lots and lots of songs. So uh, if you put in your notes, please, he recorded 35 singles that would place in the top 10, okay? And then... That includes 11 that were number one hits. Now, please understand, he became famous at age 21. Unfortunately, Hank Williams Sr. died at age 29. So his career only spanned eight years, but within that eight years, he had such a connection to the public that his songs hit number one 11 times. That's more than one number one hit per year. And he released 35 hit singles. So this guy, his, his lyrics, his uh, musical arrangement, the, the notes that he chose, everything resonated with people so much so that even still today, he's considered a major influence on country music. Um, they've, his songs have been covered by artists in all different genres of music, pop, gospel, and rock. So that just goes to show you that what he wrote was so meaningful to people that it actually transcends all different types of music. And people have covered his songs in multiple languages throughout the world. Um, so it is kind of interesting that although he started off with a very short career in country music, his legacy has spanned well over 60 years at this point. Um, please make sure that in your notes you have Hank Williams Sr. Hank Williams Sr. had a son before he passed away who was named Hank Williams Jr., who also became a musician. And then he had a son named Hank Williams III, who is also a musician. So if you Google Hank Williams, you're gonna get a lot of stuff and only a certain segment of it will be about this guy. Very similar to with the Elvis clip, I'm gonna ask you to head on over to Google Classroom and click on the link for Hank Williams so that you can hear his hit song, Hey Good Lookin'. Um, 
this, like with the Elvis clip, uh, is something that's old footage. So uh, it, it is going to be interesting for you to see how differently these two artists represent themselves. Um, if you like the Hank Williams song, please put a star in your notes next to his name. If you're not really a fan, you could put an X next to his name. I'm sure it won't hurt his feelings. Uh, and we will uh, take a look at another artist in just a moment. But take a look at Hank Williams first. Okay, and we're back. So this next uh, group you likely have heard of, even if you're not entirely sure you've heard of them. The Beatles have had a profound impact on musical history. Um, the Beatles consist of four key members. Uh, in the back on the drums, we have Ringo Starr. Uh, in the front with the guitar facing to the left is Paul McCartney. Uh, in the center, we have George Harrison. And on the other side from Paul is John Lennon. So a bit about the Beatles. Um, John Lennon and Paul McCartney, the two men on the outside, um, they actually were good friends when they were your age. They started writing music together as, as young kids. Uh, they were friends in school. Um, they would hang out together and to pass the time, they would write songs. So this was their hobby. This was something they loved and enjoyed. And so as they aged, they decided to put together a band. The first band they put together was named the Quarry Men, and they formed that band around 1955. Um, their original drummer was a guy named Peter Best, who wasn't really entirely invested and didn't really think the group was going to make it. So he quit the group, and he was replaced by Ringo Starr. So in 1960, the Beatles had their lineup, and they changed their name to the Beatles. Um, it really only took about a year at that point for them to hit big in England, where they're from. Um, so the Quarrymen toured through bars and clubs in England for a lot of years, but the Beatles really hit big after about a year. But if you remember our growth mindset video, the one about the famous failures, you'll recall that American audiences didn't have any idea who the Beatles were because American record companies would not sign them. I know it seems strange to us because we have things like Pandora and Spotify. We can source music from around the world today. But at this time, American record companies would only release American musical acts to the American public because they really didn't think that American audiences would be interested in what it is that uh, would be presented by groups from other countries. And unfortunately, they were wrong. It took until 1963, but in December of 1963, the music of the Beatles finally was released in America by an American record company. And by February of 1964, they had their first American number one hit called I Want to Hold Your Hand. It sold 2.6 million copies. So we're not talking downloads here. This wasn't a very easy click it on your computer and you've got it. 2.6 million copies during this time period means that 2.6 million people got up out of their house and drove to a record store and purchased a vinyl record of this song because they liked the Beatles that much, which is pretty impressive. So what we're actually going to see is something groundbreaking because without the Beatles having done this, other groups from other countries wouldn't have been able to make it big in America. And that's why they call this the British invasion. This has nothing to do with the American Revolution. It has everything to do with the fact that after the Beatles were signed and became such a huge hit, record companies in America figured, oh, we've got other groups we can sign. And that's how bands like the Rolling Stones became famous in America. Now, as far as our video clip for these guys, you're actually going to see I Want to Hold Your Hand, which they performed on a talk show called The Ed Sullivan Show. A couple of things I want you to notice while you watch the video clip. Um, the first is that the audience members are extremely dressed up, and that's because at this time, television was still pretty young, and not every house in America had television. So TV shows weren't that common. Um, there were only maybe three networks if you lived in a city like New York or Los Angeles. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, where these kids are, they maybe only had one or two channels. So a TV talk show filming was a big deal. So the audience members in this Beatles clip are extremely dressed up. 
Now, the other thing I'm going to point out to you is they all look very old, but they're not. In particular, there's going to be a girl wearing glasses who looks very excited. She's actually your age. And I know that because of the styling, she looks much older. But pay attention when you see her pop up on the screen because we're going to talk about the fashion of the time period. And I think that seeing her kind of gives you an idea of what kids dress like when they were dressed up during this time period. So uh, just like before, you can pause this video link and jump on over to Google Classroom and watch the clip from I Want to Hold Your Hand. Okay, we're back. So at this point, you have been exposed to the three different types of music that will be talked about in the book, The Outsiders. So if you were a fan of Elvis and Jailhouse Rock, chances are in our book, you would be what's called a greaser. A greaser is a person who belongs to a group that styles themselves um, kind of similar to the characters in the movie or musical Grease, if you've seen it. Uh, if you've not seen it, they try to do their hair a little bit like Elvis. And in order to get this look at that time, the only styling product available to them was hair grease. And so that's where the name Greaser comes from. So this was a time before gel, mousse, hairspray, the whole thing. Um, so for our greasers, Elvis was really their role model. Um, and they, they considered themselves to be pretty tough. I will tip you off right away that when we read about the greasers, they're gonna call themselves a gang. And I want you to just be aware that a gang during this time period is not the same as a gang in today's world. When we talk about gangs in today's society, there's a lot of criminal activity involved, uh, usually drugs, alcohol, illegal activities, theft, things like that. Um, during this time period, anybody who hung out with a group of friends had a gang. And that was pretty much it. And so you'll see that our characters in the novel describe themselves as just a group of friends. So by that definition, pretty much anybody belongs to a gang. Because the story is set in Tulsa, Oklahoma, we have a group called Cowboys. And quite literally, the term cowboy comes from the idea that there were men whose job it was to tend cattle. Um, cattle ranching and farming was a big part of how people made money in Tulsa, Oklahoma at this time. So for them, country music, like artists like Hank Williams, was really what they enjoyed and what they favored. And if you want to know what they dressed like, take a look back at that Hank Williams clip. They wore the cowboy hat. When they dressed up, they enjoyed those gaudy kind of suits that had like, you know, the decorative music notes and sequins and things like that. Um, but this was the style that they embraced. Now, in our book, you're going to see that there's a character named Buck Merrill. He's actually not a cattle rancher, but he does participate in rodeos. And we're going to learn a little bit more about rodeos in the end of our presentation. Um, if you liked the Beatles clip the best, chances are you were what would be called a preppy. The term preppy comes from the idea of college preparatory schools. So what does that actually mean? Well, in today's society, a lot of people go to college. But during this time period, only one out of every four people went to college. For most people, when they left high school, they got a full-time job, they bought a house, they got married, they had kids. So college wasn't as popular as it is today. So for our characters in the book, if you were a preppy, you were a kid who went to a special kind of high school or took special kind of classes called college preparatory classes. We still have schools like that today. Don Bosco is an example of something called a college prep school. Uh, but ultimately in today's world, any high school will offer you the opportunity to take college classes at a younger age so that you're prepared for that kind of situation. In our book, they're additionally referred to as socias, S-O-C-S. That does not spell socks. It's a soft C. And socias is short for socialites. And what that means is these kids, these preppies, for a lot of them were going to college because their parents had a lot of money. And so it's not that the kids were particularly in love with being in school and wanted to go on to college. Um, it's simply that their parents had the money to afford them that. And so these kids focus more on socializing. And I think you will see uh, good examples of that in the book, kids who kind of prioritize their social life beyond anything else, even though it's probably not what's best for them.
So uh, now you understand the differences between those three, mu three musical acts and the kind of kids they appealed to during this time period. So we're going to leave music behind. If you'd like, you can kind of draw a line in your notes to separate things out because we're going to move on now to movie stars, or at this time, they were known as idols. So the first one we're going to look at today is a man named Paul Newman. And believe it or not, you may already know who this guy is because he's on the grocery store shelves, my dears. Uh, Paul Newman was uh, famously somebody who gave to charity. And in the mid-1980s, after he had already been famous for about 20 years, um, he decided to start a food company called Newman's Own. And so they made things like popcorn and salad dressing and cookies. So instead of Fig Newtons, you could buy Fig Newmans. And that brand still exists. And any profits that they make actually go to charity. So that's kind of neat. So one of the first things you're going to write down about Paul Newman is that he was an award-winning actor, but he was also a director, an entrepreneur, which means he made businesses like the Newman's own brand, a humanitarian, which means he gave a lot to charity like he did through the Newman's own brand. He was also a professional race car driver. So after he became famous, he used his money to develop a skill and a talent that he was interested in that really had nothing to do with acting. And he was also an auto racing fan. Um, so what's kind of interesting about Paul Newman is he never really um, had an easy way to fame. He was somebody who had to work very hard to become famous. So he worked uh, during the 1950s on Broadway to become an actor. And he really only got very small parts and nobody really noticed him or gave him larger roles. So he decided to go to Hollywood because at this time, television was just getting started. There was a lot of filming going on in Hollywood. So in Hollywood, he got very small parts on television programs. The first time he was actually given a movie part, the film failed. And this was in 1954. So the film was a box office failure. It was called The Silver Chalice. Nobody saw it. Nobody wanted to see it, which is kind of sad. Um, so he didn't give up, though. Um, like any good person with a growth mindset, he kept trying. And eventually, in 1956, he landed the role of a very famous uh, boxer. Uh, and that boxer really existed. This was a biography movie, so it was a biopic. And he, it became a huge hit. It was called Somebody Up There Likes Me. And... Uh, fans of the boxer came to see the movie because it was about his life and they saw how amazing Paul Newman was in it and it, his popularity just exploded. By 1958 he was being offered film roles multiple times a year and all the films that were coming out were huge hits and very well received. He won Oscars during his career, he won uh, uh, the Best Actor in 1958 at the Cannes Film Festival, um, but his career actually spanned so many years that he starred in over 50 films. And if you think about it, it takes a long time to make a film. So his career actually spanned from the 1950s on through to the 2000s. Um, the last film role that he played in, you may be familiar with. He was the voice of Doc Hudson in Disney Pixar's Cars. So um, if you are a fan of Disney Pixar's Cars, you'll notice that Doc Hudson is really only featured heavily in the first movie, and that's because Paul Newman actually passed away during pre-production for Cars 2. And so the um, writers had to kind of scramble and change the script around. And so Doc Hudson really doesn't speak much in that movie. Um, by the time they wrote Cars 3, they did it as a tribute in part to Paul Newman. And the flashback scenes of Doc Hudson were done with the audio recordings that he did for Cars 1 that weren't used in the original film. So they found a way to repurpose those sound recordings and give Doc Hudson a proper send off and a proper tribute. Now, if you want to pause here, you can jump on over to Google Classroom and click into the link of Doc Hudson from the film Cars, and you'll get a nice little reminder of exactly who Paul Newman was and what he sounded like. Okay, so we're back, 
And our next movie idol is one that influenced those greaser characters in our book very heavily. It was a man named Marlon Brando. He had a very different beginning in acting uh, compared to Paul Newman. As a matter of fact, Marlon Brando uh, became famous pretty much straight away. So uh, he was born in 1924, but he ended up going to Broadway to become an actor during the 1940s. And right away, people loved him. They adored him. He was put in larger roles. And the thing that made him a huge star on Broadway was a play called A Streetcar Named Desire. He was so good in his role as Stanley Kowalski that the, when they wanted to turn it into a movie, they really couldn't imagine anybody else playing that part. So they offered it to Marlon Brando, and this is how he became a movie star. So in 1952, he starred in the movie version of the play. It became a huge hit. The following year, 1953, he starred in a movie called The Wild One, and he played the part of a character named Johnny Strabler, who was an outlaw biker and super tough. Um, he was a member of a group called the Black Rebels Motorcycle Club. Um, again, not necessarily something that parents would be crazy about during this time period, but for our young greasers who wanted to be tough, he was the perfect role model. As a matter of fact, they started dressing like him. So if you notice this picture, you'll see he's wearing a leather jacket, he's wearing blue jeans, he's wearing engineer bo boots. Um, he, he looks tough. So this is who our greasers try to model themselves after. Um, his career continued and very similar to, to Paul Newman. It spanned the rest of his life. Um, he had a huge hit with On the Waterfront in 1954. He became well known for being the Godfather during the 1970s in the movie trilogy, The Godfather. Um, he also played the part of Jor-El, the father of Superman in the Superman films of 1978. Um, what ultimately happened was uh, he was not in great health. He was a smoker. He was a drinker. Uh, and then during the 1980s, he passed away. So uh, he didn't have as many film roles as Paul Newman because he didn't live as long as Paul Newman, but still somebody who consistently worked and was consistently famous for the work that he was able to produce. Uh, so Marlon Brando's clip from the film The Wild One is waiting for you in Google Classroom. So why don't you jump on over to the presentation in Google Classroom, take a look at that, and then we'll meet you right back here. So at this point, if you want to draw a nice line for yourself, we've looked at the two actors who are going to be referenced in the book. Now we're going to jump into the cars because like most teenagers in America, uh, the kids during this time period really were excited about the idea of becoming a driver and owning a car. So we're going to look at three different types of cars. And uh, in the Google Slides presentation over in Google Classroom, you should be able to see uh, the commercials for these cars, which is kind of cool. So um, let's start off with something that still exists today, the Ford Mustang. So the Ford Mustang actually started out in 1965. Um, it was the most successful launch that the Ford Motor Company had had since the Model A Ford. Now the Model A Ford happened in the early 1900s when there just weren't any other cars available. The only people making cars was Ford. So the fact that the Mustang was able to outsell everything in the market during the 1960s when there were a ton of different choices tells you a lot about this car's appeal okay um the car was considered what we call a sports car today or a pony car is what they called it at that time and it means that the car had a long hood and a short rear so if you take a look at these pictures at the bottom the one to the left uh this one the convertible that actually is a 1960s model uh, and the one in the center, also a 1960s model. What was interesting was this car was so popular that during the 2000s, the Ford Motor Company reinvented it, redesigned it, and brought back that original Mustang body type. And uh, that's the one that it, that's uh, pinstriped in the lower right corner. Um, so the, um, the car has been popular for a long, long time, um, even though it went through a lot of different redesigns. If you go to the Ford dealer today and try to buy a Mustang, you can, but please know it does not look like any of these in the pictures. Uh, it totally was redesigned. It looks completely different nowadays. 
Um, so just so you know, the reason in part that this was so popular with young people is because it was priced reasonably. Um, young people at this time, just like now, didn't have a lot of money laying around. So in order to attract a younger audience, they priced the car pretty low. And they expected it to sell about 100,000 uh, cars in that first year. Instead, it actually sold 418,000 cars. So that quadrupled what they expected it to do. To this day, it is still one of the most popular cars that the Ford Motor Company sells. Now, if you jump on over to Google Classroom, you can actually watch the original 1960s commercial for the launch of the Ford Mustang. It is really cheesy and kind of funny. Enjoy it. Okay, so our next car that we're gonna look at is a car that does not exist anymore. Uh, if you can find this on the classic market, it is worth a ton of money because Corvairs were only produced for a very short amount of time. Notice the name is Corvair, not Corvette. Corvettes are a different car altogether, okay? But Corvairs were created by the Chevrolet company to compete with Ford because Ford was having so much success with Mustang. Um, Corvairs were produced between 1960 and 1969. They stopped producing them in part because this car was not safe. If you take a look at the pictures of it on the bottom, it doesn't look terribly dangerous to us in today's world. Uh, but, but believe it or not, because of the way this car was designed, it was super, super fast. Now, what does that mean? By today's standard, it probably isn't that fast, but this car could get up to about 80 miles an hour. And when you take that kind of speed and you couple it with inexperienced teen drivers, um, it became problematic. So um, the Corvair originally was sold pretty much for anybody, but the way it handled became an issue because if you take a look at this car, this is a car that, um, if you notice, doesn't seem to have a very um, stable top. We have the convertible version in two of the pictures. And even the one that's the hard top uh, doesn't seem to have uh, too much of a solid base. Um, this car was actually the subject of a 1965 book called Unsafe at Any Speed. And what that book noticed and studied was the fact that for the five years between 1960 and 1965, this car had a history of flipping over. So when it would pick up speed, it actually became so lightweight that the car would flip. And these young and experienced drivers didn't know how to manage that. Um, and so consumer advocate Ralph Nader came out and wrote this book about this car. And as a result, in 1966, the sales of this car fell to half of what it was in 1965. So um, this between um, the bad press and the fact that the Mustang was dominating the market. Um, and Chevy had another sports car that was selling much better and was much safer, the Camaro. Um, they decided by 1968 that they were gonna stop creating the Corvair. So the last model of Corvair that existed was in 1969. And ultimately, um, like I said, in the collector market nowadays, it's hugely popular. Uh, and very expensive to get your hands on one of these because so many of these cars just don't exist anymore since they were only produced for nine years. So if you'd like to take a look at the commercial for the Chevy Corvair, that is also waiting for you over, over in the slideshow in Google Classroom. So bounce on over there, take a look at the commercial. Again, very cheesy, very much of the time period, uh, but you'll get a sense of what this marketing was like for this car. Uh, so pause me here and we'll meet you back here in a second. Okay, the last car we're going to look at is actually a car from the 1950s. Why? Because this is the kind of car that our greasers could afford. If you think about it, some teenagers don't buy a new car. They buy a used car because that's cheaper. It's less expensive. And greasers during this time period were no different because they didn't have a lot of financial advantages. They bought the cheapest cars they could. And for them, that included the Chevy 150. Now, because these cars at this time were between five and 10 years old, 
um, they wanted to make them look different. So if you take a look in the lower right corner, this is what the car originally looked like when it sold during the 1950s. But if you take a look over here to the left, this is what our greasers would do. They would customize the car. They would try to make it look tough. They would try to make it look sporty so that they could be proud of what they were driving. So um, it really did introduce the idea of personalizing your car, detailing it, uh, you know, putting decals on it, pinstripes, uh, making it look like a race car. And so ultimately, um, you know, any kind of, of uh, individualization of car design, we can in part uh, hand to the creativity of kids during the 1960s who were personalizing their used cars to make them look cool. Um, so this car originally was sold to families. Uh, it is a very large car. It is heavy. It is slow. It is a gas guzzler. This is not the kind of car that you would want today. Um, it is also extraordinarily loud. So um, for our video clip over in Google Classroom, you're not going to see a commercial for this car. Instead, um, what you're going to see is an actual video clip of one of these cars being driven today. And it's not a long clip, it's maybe only 15 seconds, but I wanted you to be able to hear what it is that these uh, particular cars sounded like. So uh, what you'll notice is that our, uh, in your notes, you're gonna wanna put down that greasers were the ones who purchased these cars. Um, so there's not a lot else really to say about them except that they were customized. So that means these guys made it personal so that they looked cool, okay? So take a pause here and let's pop on over to Google Classroom and you can take a look at that very short clip of the uh, Chevy 150. So we're back, and this time around, we're going to be looking at their clothes. Uh, because again, the way we dress sometimes helps to identify the groups that we hang out with. And this isn't really news to you. If there's you know, a particular artist that you love, you may try to dress like them. If you're a Swifty, you might be wearing sequins when you go to the Taylor Swift concert, right? Um, Similarly, if you belong to a sports team, you may wear the jersey on a game day, right? So this isn't any different, really, from the way these kids conducted themselves. Um, during this time period of this novel, we had two different styles completely. Uh, our preppies, or our socias, S-O-C-S, were the ones that wore uh, wholesome clothes, meaning that they looked neat and tidy to the grown-ups. Boys wore khakis, baggy pants, v-neck sweaters, and leather shoes. Girls wore these big, long poodle skirts. Uh, they came down to about the middle of their shins, okay? They're also known as circle skirts. They would wear a slip underneath them. They would wear a sweater set, so a sweater uh, with a cardigan over, over top of it. Uh, they wore little ankle socks called bobby socks and saddle shoes, which are shoes that are white in the front and back and black in the middle. Um, as we mentioned earlier, the term preppy comes from those college preparatory schools. Uh, in the book, they're referred to more frequently as socias. For our greasers, what you're going to want to take down is that they modeled themselves after the wild one, which was Marlon Brando's big movie. Uh, the boys would wear tight black or blue jeans, white t-shirts, black boots, those engineer boots, um, and they would wear a black leather jacket or a denim jacket. Leather jackets were expensive back then, they're expensive now. So if you couldn't afford a leather jacket, you actually would get a denim jacket. Um, girls would wear tight sweaters, short skirts, and heavy makeup. So these girls were uh, into a more fitted look. And the term greaser, as I mentioned to you earlier, has to do with the hair oil that boys would use in their hair. So let's take a look at what this looks like. Over here, we have our greaser. And over here, we have our soche or preppy. Okay, so it kind of gives you that idea. Um, a lot of people associate this look more with the 1950s, but this was still popular in the early 1960s when this book was set. Um, and like I said earlier, if you've ever seen the movie or the musical Grease, uh, it's very consistent with the way these kids dress in this book. 
What did these kids do for fun? They hung out. What else is new? Um, they actually went to a place called the Drive-In Movies. And here's why. Drive-In Movies actually happen outside. There is a giant video screen and on it they would project films and people would drive their cars up to it. If you take a look, these little poles with the little round discs on them, those were speakers. So you would drive up to uh, a speaker and you would take the speaker and you would hinge it on your door of your car, which scratched a lot of car paint, but people didn't seem to mind. And that's how you would hear the movie that was being projected on the big screen, okay? Um, Part of the reason teens love to do this is because most drive-in movies could not start until eight or nine o'clock when it was dark outside. So what does that mean? Well, in this time period, the 1950s and 60s, um, kids were usually expected to be home by dark and there was nothing open past 10 p.m. But the drive-in movies were different. Drive-in movies very often would show a double feature. And what that means is a movie would start at eight or nine o'clock and then they'd show you a second movie that would start once the first movie ended. So you could be out until midnight and tell your parents you were at the drive-in movie theater. And so for a lot of these kids, that was a very popular way to go, okay? Um, you'll notice in this picture, we have a young man who's kind of climbing out of the trunk. That's because people were charged by the person in their car. So if you couldn't afford to go to the drive-in movies, and you can see how big these cars are, uh, you can fit a few friends in the trunk of the car and uh, only the driver pays. And at the time you paid maybe 25 cents to get in uh, per person. And if there's only one person in the car, that's 25 cents. They're not checking the trunk to see if you've got two or three friends hiding back there. So uh, drive-in movies, very popular at this time period. Another popular hangout that's really tied to our setting of Tulsa, Oklahoma, is the rodeo. So as we talked about earlier, cattle ranching, farming, dairy farms, these are all the way people in Oklahoma made their money at this time. So the rodeo actually was developed as a way of using those skills from cattle ranching and farming and showcasing them, okay? So actually, what is a rodeo? It's a show where cowboys and cowgirls uh, showcase their roping skills and their riding skills, okay? It was considered a sport and still is considered a sport by some people today. Um, the earliest rodeos actually started in the 1830s, but they became hugely popular in the 1940s and stayed popular through the beginning of the 1980s. Um, you know, there are animal rights activists that are very against rodeos in today's world, but up until the 1980s, people still considered this a very popular sport. Um, in the Google Classroom link, if you wanna take a, a look in there, uh, you actually will see a film that kind of covers what a rodeo is like. And uh, the rodeo in particular took place in Calgary, Canada, which goes to show you this wasn't just an American phenomenon. Rodeo was popular all over the world and for some places still is today, uh, particularly uh, in our country in the South and the Southwest. So pause me here, take a look at that link and come on back. Okay, so what we're going to do is have you jump into a KWL chart, just like we did in the beginning of 910, because I'm interested in knowing what you already know about the 60s. Uh, I'm interested in knowing what you want to know, because that, that always feeds our conversation. I'd love for you to get your questions answered. And I'd love to know what you learned from looking at the slides in this presentation. So let's uh, grab a KWL chart from the front of the room, and you can spend a couple of minutes uh, filling this out. And if you still have time left over, now would be a great time to jump into Achieve 3000 and get done this week's Achieve article, which is uh, the Pi Day article for Ms. Mena and the other math teachers. So if you have Ms. D'Souza, you still are expected to do that Pi Day article. The questions for that article should be in your Google Classroom for math. Uh, and as always, if you have any questions for me, do me a favor, send me an email. I'll be back in the building this afternoon, and I'm always happy to answer your questions. Have a good one, guys.